Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to say first, uh, welcome everyone to Measuring Progress online forum on well-being. Just as a reminder, we are recording today's event, uh, which we'll make available online for future reference. Uh, I am Kelsey O'Connor, one of the organizers at StatTech Research, uh, part of Luxembourg's Institute for Statistics and Economic Studies. We are pleased to see a large turnout, uh, especially from so many different groups. Um, we have academics, practitioners, policymakers, and representatives of various institutions that are registered and uh, currently joining. Uh, and that's actually one of the advantages of these uh, virtual events. So uh, we can be appreciative of that. Nice. We also believe that this illustrates a growing awareness of the value of well-being studies, which uh, you know, we're major proponents of. Um, today, we welcome Stefano Bartolini and Richard Eastland as the first two speakers in a series of six talks. On the 28th and 29th of June, we will also welcome four additional speakers, uh, which I think many of you have seen already in the uh, online website. Uh, before we get started uh, with Stefano Bartolini's talk, uh, our director, Dr. Serge Allegretza, would like to share a few words. Uh, Dr. Allegretza, if you're ready, yeah, the thank, floor thank is yours. You, thank you, thank you, thank Kelsey. You. Do you hear me? It's yes. working fine? Okay, yes, thank you very much. So I, I will make a brief introduction because I, I remember that we tried to organize this big conference uh, last, it was last year, I think in March. It was just before the pandemic started and I struggled a lot with uh, Chiara and other colleagues because I wanted to organize this workshop and uh, and then we were overwhelmed uh, by the by the coronavirus and uh, everything had to be deleted uh, and so we postponed the conference to this year but uh, then still uh, we are not back to normal so we have to wait and I think it was a good decision to split it into two so this year we will have uh, those presentations uh, webinars uh, which take uh, which take place in the next uh, couple of weeks and next year I hope that we can do the conference where we are in person and we will not lose time with uh, presenting PowerPoints but mainly discussing uh, all the controversial uh, issues uh, that uh, are uh, discussed in the literature but also the interaction with policymakers for example in our country our parliament uh, now has discussed uh, last year about how to link well-being uh, well-being with uh, policy making and budgetary policies and uh, some countries are more advanced in this for example france and italy or new zealand and uh, so you see that the interest of policy makers is is uh, is growing and that's exactly what we want to do because it's not only about research, it's about making applied research, making research helpful, instrumental for better economic and social policies. Uh, so to make sure that well-being of uh, the whole population is, uh, is increasing. Uh, it's an amazing project. I remember that uh, I was in Palermo with uh, Giovannini, who at that time was the head of statistics at the OECD department. And uh, he has launched this, uh, this whole movement on the progress uh, indicators. And uh, nobody believed that it would succeed until uh, there was this big report, uh, St. Fitusi Stiglitz, uh, which then uh, made that uh, a lot of institutions, international institutions, governments really seized this opportunity and discovered in a way uh, this uh, huge literature which had developed which which developed uh, over the years and of course I'm very happy that Professor Easterlin uh, could join because I think he is a pioneering uh, scholar in, in this matter and also Stefano Bartolini who, who did a lot in this in this field and uh, I, I think that um, it is a real opportunity uh, to make this literature well known and the literature which it's uh, really quickly increasing and I'm very happy that our institute, uh, thanks to Francesco and Kelsey, uh, could make some significant uh, contribution uh, to this uh, to this literature. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I, I would like to, to to give the floor for for the presentation. And uh, I hope that uh, there will be some interactions. Of course, it will not be that quality that we could have 
if we are sitting together, but I hope that there will be some uh, interesting uh, conversations afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Serge. I feel uh, closely aligned with what you've said. Uh, so it's, it's a nice way to, to get everything started. Uh, so uh, I'll continue a little bit uh, with uh, some uh, additional organizational information uh, before I introduce uh, Stefano Bartolini. So we have a, a large number of participants uh, and we want to facilitate as many questions as possible. So please post your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, my colleagues Francesco Sarracino and Pauline Pere will then read out those questions uh, for our speakers to respond. And uh, to keep the, the sound uh, to a minimum, we're going to try to keep all the microphones muted so we can hear our speakers best. Uh, now to welcome Stefano Bartolini. Uh, Stefano Bartolini is Professor of Political Economy and Economics of Happiness at the University of Siena. He has authored several popular science essays and numerous articles published in prestigious academic journals. His recent book, The Manifesto for Happiness, has already been published in five languages. Uh, Stefano has collaborated with the OECD, the World Bank, and the International Panel on Social Progress. His research starts from the observation that the current economic and social order appears unsustainable in at least three dimensions, contributing to the degradation of the natural environment and interpersonal relationships and human well-being. The crucial questions motivating his activity are, why does this happen? And most importantly, is it possible to reconcile economic prosperity with a better quality environment and relationships and well-being? Uh, with that, I'll turn the floor over to Stefano. Are you ready to uh, get started and share yeah. your presentation? Okay. I'll share my presentation. Great. Can you see? Yes, we can see it, and it is gone full screen. Okay. Um, my talk will be about uh, the implications uh, of happiness studies for the e ecology. Uh, the biosphere is in trouble, and tackling uh, ecological crisis cannot be postponed any farther. On this, there is growing agreement among policymakers, scientists, and the public. Disagreements arise about the solutions. On one hand, there are techno-optimists that argue that the solution is to adopt technology with uh, technologies with low environmental impact. This could end the conflict between growth and the environment, allowing green growth. And on the other hand, Eco-pessimists accept that green technologies are part of the solution, but they should be combined with limits to economic growth. Eco-pessimists hold that the anthropic pressure on ecosystems will remain unsustainable if the economy and the population continue to grow, notwithstanding green technological progress. The view that the road to sustainability goes through the limitation of growth generally leads to pessimistic conclusions about the feasibility of a sustainable economy. Pessimism originates from two widespread beliefs. The first is that humankind tends to unlimited expansion. And the second is that limiting growth is politically impossible. Indeed, the policy of limits to growth have never gathered wide consensus. Economic growth is a priority of political parties, agendas, and public concerns, and a turnaround does not seem realistic in the near future. Therefore, the idea that limiting growth is crucial for sustainability easily translates into ecological pessimism. Uh, limiting growth seems a politically mi impossible mission. So pessimism spreads among, the, among ecologists. The collapsology, popular in France, predicts the collapse of civilization. Influential ecologists uh, suggest to give up the struggle against climate change. Optimism hurts, they say, because it leads us to throw money and energy into a lost cause. Better to give up and dedicate our resources to something in which we can su succeed. Eco-pessimism spreads uh, 
well beyond the borders of ecologism. Uh, this table shows the, the respondents uh, agreeing that civilization as we know will collapse in the year to come in five countries. In Italy, 71% of people agree. In France, 65. In Germany, which is the most optimistic country of the West, of the of the West, uh, almost uh, four, four out of ten citizens uh, think uh, agreed that civilization will collapse. My point is uh, that uh, the eco pessimist uh, criticism to uh, techno optimism are correct, but this does not justify pessimism. Both beliefs on which eco pessimism is based are wrong indeed. These are the two beliefs. I, I repeat it. Humans tend to permanent expansion and limiting growth is politically impossible. Um, I would substitute this belief, these beliefs with other two. Human demographic and economic expansion on the on the planet is likely to peak within decades. And the large literature on happiness and social capital suggests a politically feasible path to limit growth. Uh, now, the, uh, I, my introduction, long introduction is finished, and now I get into my argument. First, by checking the eco pessimist criticism to tech, techno optimist. Uh, the, these criticisms are based on the concept of great acceleration. Uh, two graphs uh, are enough to illustrate it. Uh, the first one is this. The impressive population boom of the past two centuries. It is a result of the collapsing mortality caused by the improvement in hygiene, food and health standards brought uh, by the Industrial Revolution. And the second graph is this. The explosion of per capita income again in the past two centuries. Um, so, based uh, on the uh, great acceleration idea, eco pessimists uh, claim that uh, we have become too many and many of us consume too much. Technology is not the only problem. There is also a population and uh, per capita income growth problem. And these are the ecological consequences of the great acceleration. Each one of these uh, iconic graphs uh, represents an ecological crisis. The contrast between techno optimism and eco pessimism runs through the entire scientific and political history of the debate on environmental issues. These two positions are well visible still in the current debate on climate change. So, on this basis, uh, um, Eco pessimists claim that there's no solution without reducing economic growth. Growth put the biosphere under too much pressure, pressure and evidence support their claims. Uh, there is evidence of relative decoupling, uh, which means that environment da damage grows less than GDP, but no evidence suggests that absolute decoupling is possible, which means that more GDP brings less environmental damage. So my first conclusion is eco pessimists are right. Limiting economic growth is essential. Green, green growth is an illusion. However, pessimism is unjustified. This shouldn't lead to pessimism because we are not amidst a great acceleration. We are on the edge of a great deceleration. In fact, the good news is that the 21st century could look very different from the two preceding ones. Let's see the demography. In, demo in uh, demography, 2.1 is a key number. It is the average number of children per woman necessary to keep the population constant in a country. The average number of children per woman is called the fertility rate and 2.1 is is called the replacement fertility rate. Now, everybody knows that the population is diminishing uh, net of immigration in Western countries uh, and in all industrial countries because fertility is too low, below 2.1 kids per woman. But not everybody knows that many developing countries are below 2.1 uh, kids per woman. 
at this table, it illustrates the drop of fertility rates in 10 developing countries that together make up half of the world population. Everywhere, fertility is below or rapidly approaching the replacement level. Look at China and India, for example, that used to be the demographic nightmare of the world. Uh, 1.7 kids per woman in China, 2.2 in India, where fertility is in free fall. So that's why the population, the world population will downsize. This is an undisputed forecast among demographers. What is up for debate is when this will happen, in any case, within decades. And now let's turn to economic growth. Vigorous economic growth is a distant memory in industrial countries. In the figure, you see the average growth rates of total GDP per decade in four countries. Growth was rapid in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s, but since the 80s, it has generally fallen below 2%. The same picture is depicted by per capita growth rates per decade. This, this slide is uh, uh, on total GDP. And now let's see per capita GDP, which gives the same picture. Um, so after 40 years of sluggish growth, economists realized that industrial economies entered the phase of secular stagnation. Uh, with this term, economists uh, mean uh, slow growth over the long term. And uh, the growth deceleration involves developing countries as well. The growth rates of the Chinese economy in recent year, which are around 6%, dwarf Western ones, but they're far below those of the roaring 90s when China grew up to 15% per year. So, my first conclusion, these trends are stable enough to indicate a future great deceleration. Declining population and the stagnation of per capita income will probably deflate the, the global economy. Despite uncertainties on the date, human expansion on, the, on Earth is likely to peak within decades. And of course, this is breaking news. We have always expanded uh, since uh, we first appeared on this planet. However, pessimism, but this is breaking news for sustainability. The growth would gradually relieve the human pressure uh, on the environment, especially if it is accompanied by a transition to green technologies. So there is no human tendency to unlimited expansion. The future we see now is far more reassuring for sustainability than the one visible a few decades ago, when the context suggested that the population naturally tended to expand in the absence of Malthusian constraints. So, what are the bad news? The bad news, the problem is that that deceleration may still need too much time to take place. In the meanwhile, the risk of collapse of crucial ecosystem grows alongside with the global economy, uh, uh, about 3% yearly growth, and the population about uh, 80 million more per year. In short, even if the end of the great acceleration is within reach, sustainability requires a faster transition to the growth than the system has shown so, so far. And here we go again. The block on the road to sustainability is the seems to be the political impossibility of, the, uh, of uh, limits to growth, but I'm not convinced of that. Let's see on what such impossibility depends. Clearly, the consensus to growth depends on the fact that in our culture, growth is the main perspe perspective to improve lives. Uh, for two centuries, we have relied on growth to improve lives. In our collective imagination, progress means being able to buy, to buy more stuff. And this is well summarized by Sophie Tucker, who stated that uh, have been poor, have been rich and have been poor. Rich is better. Also, uh, Coco Chanel summarized why money is so important. The best things in life are, very, are free. The second best are very expensive.
itself, no growth. And then what? How could the quality of life be improved without economic growth? What is progress in the absence of growth? The political weakness of ecologism is grounded on the vagueness of the answer to such questions. Ecologism does not offer an alternative to growth. Giving up on growth is not a project. It simply is giving up the growth project. So in the absence of an alternative perspective to growth for improving lives, li limits to growth take on the flavor of sacrifice. Here is where the political weakness of ecologism originates. It seems to propose to live worse. Less consumption is unattractive because it equates leading grim, unhappy existences. Uh, the message of ecology seems to, be, seems to be that we must make sacrifices to protect the future. If we want a better environment, we must have less money. This expl explanation of the political impotence of ecologism has an important implication. The consensus to economic growth may be eroded if an alternative to growth as a means to improve lives emerged. Such an alternative, as a matter of fact, is emerging. Uh, my point is that, that a huge body of research on happiness and social capital suggests how to improve lives without economic growth. By improving lives, I'm, I mean increasing happiness. So let's see what we, we have learned from happiness studies. First, what we share is, much, is more important to happiness than what we own. Money has a little importance and mainly at low income levels. It makes some difference in happiness, but at higher levels of, uh, of income, the difference is negligible. What is really very important is the quality of human relationships for happiness, uh, which is a form of sharing, of course. Uh, relationships are something that we share but also our, our other forms of sharing uh, are important. For example, sharing high quality uh, of natural and built environments uh, give to our brain injections of endorphin, uh, um, which make, makes us happier. Um, and this discovery has very important implications for sustainability. Sharing makes people happy and does not pollute. Possessing does not make people happy and pollutes. So if we want to live more happily and sustainably, we need to make social and economic choices that expand sharing and not possession. And we also know how to do it. I focus on social capital uh, as a main form of sharing, and we know that there are several policies for social capital uh, that can work. Uh, this is the least. Now I give some hints on that. Um, cities. What well, in cities, uh, the uh, social fabric is has always been created in common spaces, the streets and the squares where all citizens can meet. Uh, and this has always worked for 5,000 years uh, since the cities first existed, and then cars arrived. And they worsened dramatically the quality of the common space, uh, causing the decline of its capacity to create a social fabric. So it is critical to improve the quality of the shared space. In, in within cities uh, and uh, studies in um, urban studies show how to do it. Uh, we know what is the, the 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 features. What are the features of a happy city? It must have a high residential density. The worst from this point of view are the suburbs, low density suburbs, which are typical in American cities where it is very difficult to create uh, social aggregation, especially because uh, they create uh, a total car dependence. Uh, neighborhoods must be mixed use. Um, the te current tendency to create neighborhoods which are only uh, residential or only commercial or only for working uh, should be overcome. Uh, neighborhoods must have all the functions within. 
and there must be plenty of pedestrian areas, green, pedestrian areas, green areas, sports centers. They must be walkable. There must be plenty of uh, interest interest points, uh, uh, such as uh, post offices, uh, shops, uh, um, libraries, because uh, people should. Uh, this strategy reduces the need for mobility uh, within cities, and mobility is a problem from the point of view of social of the social fabric. And then. We should totally change uh, the way the mobility within cities with car restrictions, par public transport, cycling, um, sharing. Uh, we should dramatically reduce uh, traffic within cities. Uh, and the reason is that traffic uh, is, uh, is an enemy of the social fabric. And oh, this kind of project uh, works also for uh, making a city sustainable. Because reducing the need for mobility means uh, consuming less, uh, less oil. Let's pass to teaching methods. More sharing is also critical for, for schooling. We know that participatory teaching fosters happiness and social capital. Participatory teaching is based on uh, uh, students working on common projects. Um, the central relationship uh, within a participatory classroom is, is between uh, the students um, are the students that ask pr the professor questions uh, to to get help uh, to put forward their their, their project, but uh, um, the 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 kind of uh, uh, teaching method that prevails in the in the most Western countries is vertical teaching. Uh, in which the central relationship uh, in the classroom is between uh, students, is between the teacher and the students. The students take notes, read the test books, uh, and they have a very passive role. Uh, so, um, we, the participatory teaching methods have been widely adopted in Northern European countries, uh, which uh, um, score very high in international comparisons of academic achievements, uh, showing that there is no conflict between developing cognitive and emotional intelligence. We should also change the work experience, and we know how to do it. The evolution of the, over the past decades of work organization has been uh, uh, more competition, more pressure, controls, stress, incentives, conflicts, uh, and of course, as a collateral effect, uh, we have an enormous crisis of job satisfaction that has uh, led uh, to uh, some epidemics of uh, suicides in some companies. Uh, and also, we have a crisis of relationships within firms. Uh, uh, here you see an image uh, of uh, what they are, they are becoming. But uh, uh, we know also that less hierarchy, flatter organization, more cooperation, less incentives, uh, develop uh, um, intrinsic motivations and uh, are strongly related to higher productivity uh, within firms. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, shift to a, more, a less hierarchical uh, um, company organization, it, 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 there are so many companies that are doing that now, and they are profitable, and they perfectly work. So uh, this is another change that could promote happiness and also relationship within firms. Advertising. Advertising spreads the illusion that the solution to all problems is to buy, which means a private solution. Uh, advertising uh, is an enemy of the mentality of sharing. Uh, but there are many examples of regulations now that can prevent this effect. Uh, of course, I have no time to get into the details, but uh, there's, a, uh, there's a paper that you can read on, uh, on this presentation. And uh, all this would have uh, huge effects on health because happiness and relationships, according to epidemiological studies, play a, a dominant role in the health of individuals and populations. Uh, look, for example, of the impact uh, of social isolation on the elderly. 
um, compared to uh, to elderly with uh, higher social activity, socially isolated people have a higher probability of development and progression of cardio cardiovascular disease, dementia, memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, all cause mortality. The guy in the picture is always Alzheimer, and. Um, um, this, in practice, this is a list of all the diseases which are typical of the old age, and they are very strongly related uh, to relational poverty. So, promoting happiness and especially relationships means promoting health. The healthcare system is the end station of distress. All uh, distress problems uh, turns now turn out uh, to become health problems before or later. And so we should focus on policies for relationships as a prevention, as a form of uh, a preven sickness, sickness prevention. Especially, we should tackle loneliness of the elderly. And there are very uh, interesting experiences on how to do it, especially Japan. They are doing something great on this. What happens if all this is not done? What happens in the in the absence of this kind of policies? Well, the consequence is that the economy grows too much from both the point from the point of view of both the environment and happiness. Um, this is the concept of defensive growth that uh, on which I worked uh, with uh, my co-authors uh, Francesco Saracino and Luigi Bonatti. And defensive growth. Um, here you have an image of loneliness and an image of pollution. How will, will people react to this? Um, imagine that the city in which you live in becomes too dangerous to go out at night. Uh, or, or that your network of friends disappear, you call people and nobody wants to, to go out, they have no time, so you have to spend your nights at home. And in order to have uh, pleasant evenings, you fill up your home with all kinds of home entertainment. In this way, you are compensated and compensating a lack of relationship with something which is costly. Relationships are shared and are free, but home entertainment is costly. The same holds for uh, for the elderly, for instance. In, um, in uh, my country, the elderly um, used to, to live a very active social life. Uh, which now disappeared because then the social fabric in the neighborhoods disappeared. And now we need uh, a caregiver uh, or a retirement house, which are costly while the social fabric is free. And the same holds for children, for kids. Uh, in my, I belong to a generation which grew up in the streets, uh, always in, with a gang of friends. Nobody, no kids, no kid does it anymore because the cities have become too dangerous because of traffic. So now uh, kids uh, grow within their homes and, they, and we need a lot of money to fill uh, their loneliness with uh, toys, all kinds of toys. We need babysitters. Uh, so mostly the message is that uh, money can compensate the, the scarcity of social capital, the scarcity of relationship. And, and this also holds, uh, for the environment, if the the lake, the river, or the sea close to your home becomes too polluted to swim in, you can buy a, um, a holiday on a, on a tropical resort, which is costly, while the sea or the river close to your home are free. So the message is: when our, our shared goods, like social capital and the environment, decline, we need money, and in order to get more money, we have to work more, to compete more, and in this way we increase GDP. But uh, the increase of, GD of GDP in turn can uh, um, cause the decline of uh, the environment and of relationships. We uh, are too hurried to take care of our relationships. And um, so this is a vicious circle. A vicious circle in which uh, we react to the, to the poverty of shared goods by uh, increasing our incomes, but the increase, uh, the following increase of GDP, still uh, can still worsen 
the common goods uh, causing uh, a vicious circle in which uh, uh, in which uh, people react to negative externalities by increasing GDP and but the increasing GDP turns out to increase negative externalities. This is called defensive growth because people defend themselves uh, from the decline of uh, common goods by increasing their incomes. So this is the world that we create of private wealth, uh, which is faced by the, co the poverty of what we have in common. There's evidence that the poorer are people relationships and the greater is their concern for, for money, which uh, uh, is in accordance with the predictions of uh, uh, defensive growth. So the crisis of relationships generates growth. When relationships get vanish, money becomes more important. Some evidence, the crisis of the environment is strictly connected to, to three social crises uh, in uh, the view of defensive growth. The crisis of happiness, the crisis of relationships, and the crisis of time. And the most seriously ill countries are the US, China, and India, uh, which are the three countries that uh, are the most celebrated examples of economic growth. Uh, the U.S. is the faster growing country in uh, in the West. China and India are the fastest growing countries among developing countries. Uh, um, and my point is that is that a part of their growth is is defensive, is a reaction to the decline of uh, happiness and uh, relationships. Uh, let's. Uh, have a quick look to uh, some objective data on happiness uh, in uh, in the US. There's an epidemic of anxiety and depression of mental illnesses in the US. That's th these are big numbers. The age, uh, the the suicide rate increased by 24 percent in 15 years. The share of psych psychiatrically medicated adult, adult population reached uh, one. American out of five. Addictions. Uh, the impressive overdose crisis in the US, especially by opioids uh, that killed. Now uh, it, it, it reached to kill, to kill 90,000 Americans. Uh, just to have an idea of how many they are, think that. Uh, in the entire Vietnam War, only 58,000 U.S. soldiers died, in, which lasted 10 years. In China and India, we have similar data on, uh, object, on uh, objective happiness. So suicides, mental illnesses, addictions, and psychiatric drugs are on the rise. Loneliness has become a mass problem in the U.S. Uh, uh, families have turned to be increasingly unstable. Uh, there are enormous generational cleavages, uh, declining trust, solidarity, honesty, social participation, civic engagement, worsening relationships among friends, family members, neighbors, and trends again are similar in, Ch in China and India. And these are three overworked countries. Uh, work hours increased in the past decades in the US, differently from Europe. In China, the, uh, many companies adopt uh, the 996 uh, uh, work schedule, which means nine hours per day, um, which means from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day for six days per week. It makes 72 hours uh, uh, of work per week. What uh, what I've been showing you now is that uh, um, the crisis of happiness and relationship can boost GDP uh, because people will react to the poverty of common goods of current common goods by increasing their incomes. Uh, so, but what happens in a society when the awareness of a future ecological crisis spreads? 
uh, uh, this is a mathematical model, but I will illustrate it uh, through um, graphics. Uh, these are two identical cities, which in uh, um, which at the beginning of our story are identical, but and but uh, they experience an ecological crisis. The water rises and fills with waste, and people get scared. They begin to ask questions on, on the future. They, they are worried about their kids because scientists say that within 30 years, um, the situation will, uh, will worsen if the, the, the two cities don't stop building. And they, until this point, these two cities are very similar, but uh, there's a, a, a big difference between them. In Colaborandia, people trust their political system, and in Privatopoli, they do not. So let's look at the reactions in Colaborandia. Uh, people uh, meet and discuss and try to find a solution. The, the guy in the middle of the uh, of the gra of um, the, the graphics is the major of the city. They discuss all together and they make a project to get out uh, of the ecological crisis based on uh, renewable energies, um, planting more trees, uh, and working less. They want to stop working at six o'clock in the afternoon because they know that they must produce less and consume less. Now, look at the critical point. Look at how different is their reaction in Rivatopoli. These are two uh, representative, uh, representative family in Privatopoli. The, the, um, the couple uh, on, uh, on the left, uh, they just have uh, a baby and they are thinking of the future of their baby. They're thinking uh, that in 30 years, uh, the lows, the, the lower level of the city will be very close uh, to a stinky water, uh, polluted, uh, very humid. Uh, so people who will live uh, at the lower floor will live in awful conditions. Uh, so they want their, their kid to live in the higher levels of the city where the situa situation will be better and uh, the, the people will, be, um, will not be so close to the water. And to live in the higher levels, their, their kid will need money. So they decide to work, to leave more money to their kid, to make, to make it possible to live in a higher level of this. This is a private reaction to a common problem and in doing and in having this private reaction accumulating money they they generate further economic growth the evolution of collaborandia in the uh, following years is uh, the people here you, you have an image uh, of Collaborandia, of the square of Collaborandia at six o'clock in the afternoon. Nobody is working anymore, and people enjoy um, a nice square with a nice garden. And now look at the square. People are, are rushed, they are all working. The city is crowded and very, and very polluted. And the, at six o'clock, they are all working. And now, Let's get to the final of the story, the evolution of these two cities after 30 years. Colaborandia has not changed a lot. And uh, this symbolizes the fact that uh, GDP has grown, uh, has di didn't, didn't substantially grow in uh, Colaborandia. Um, and now look at the picture, uh, um, at the image of Privatopolis. Privatopolis uh, is uh, very polluted, very crowded. Uh, the level of the sea has grown um, and the city has all totally changed because GDP is much higher in uh, Privatopolis as a consequence of the attempt of people to protect their descendants uh, from uh, um, ecological decay. But people live better in Collaborandia. Collaborandia is more slow, more social, less polluted. Of course, GDP is lower, but the quality of life is higher. So this is a story on how we may uh, become, how we may become unsustainable. 
uh, by trying to defend our descendants from common decay, but uh, with the wrong answer, which is only a private answer to a common problem. The starting question was, what happens when the awareness of a future ecological crisis spreads? And the answer is, there are two possible different out outcomes, depending on people trust that the crisis can be faced by the political system. In Privatopolis, private defense from collective degradation produces more collective degradation. Privatopolis is a tragedy of collective impotence. Stefan, I'm sorry to uh, stop you on your roll. Just a few more minutes, and uh, we have a, a few questions lining up for you already. So that way we get to more questions. Okay, um, I see that I'm running out of time, so I'll get uh, very quickly to my conclusion. Um, Privatopolis is a, uh, so I'll skip on the slides now. I have to be quick. Privatopolis is a description. Um, Privatopolis is a description of uh, how we could we could be, how we are, because Privatopolis has two um, critical features. People care about future generation and people don't trust politics. I'll briefly mention uh, a work that I have done with uh, Francesco Saracino on the importance uh, that people attribute to the distant future. I mean, the future that uh, concerns only uh, future generations. We um, used the questions on uh, surveys asking people this kind of question. So humanity has a bright future or humanity has a bleak future. Which one of these two statements come closer to your view? So these questions ask uh, the vision of the future, the expectation of the future that people ask. And then we put this expectation in a happiness regression and a standard happiness regression simply augmented with uh, future expectations. And what we found is that uh, people with negative future expectations are at least 13% less happy than those with positive expectations, which is a big number. So the message uh, is that expectation of the distant future are very important for present happiness. Uh, in this uh, paper, we also take into account uh, the possible endogeneity of the relationship between future expectation and happiness, and uh, uh, it works. The message is that the, the, our vision of the future is a very important component of our current happiness. So people care about the future. And, and the other feature of Privatopolis is the mistrust in the political systems. Uh, look at this. This is trust in government in the United States. Uh, in the 50s, uh, it was almost 80%. Now it's 20%. This is not an American peculiarity. These uh, graphs uh, are uh, are common to all industrial economies. Uh, so the, pro the problem is that uh, Privatopolis is describing our world, a world in which people care about uh, the future, but uh, think that the only possible solutions are private because they don't trust collective action. Uh, pol political action is the most important form of pol collective action. So. I get uh, to my final po point. Uh, um, sorry. Green growth is an illusion, but this should not lead to pessimism. It is not true that humans tend to unlimited expansion. It is not true that the reduction of growth is a political utopia. The political weakness of ecology is depend on the lack of an alternative to growth as a means to increase the quality of life. Studies on happiness, social capital, and other topics suggest how to improve life independently of growth. This entail the, the shift of ecology into this kind of uh, narrative. Uh, it's a very substantial shift, uh, but could gain political consensus. Uh, uh, in particular, ecology should shift from the policy of limitations of growth to the construction of social capital and of a, of a happier society. Um, a necessary condition for doing this is to 
to recover the, the trust in politics, in the political systems. Without trust in collective actions, we run the risk of private answers to collective problems that worsen the collective problem. Many thanks for your attention. I'm sorry I took too much time. Uh, that was great stuff, Nu. Thank you very much for uh, this provocative talk. Uh, you can see some questions in the chat. Uh, others, uh, please feel free to add. And just if you can, uh, both you, Stefano, and any questions, make them brief, and that way we can try to get to uh, as many as possible. Uh, with that, then uh, Pauline will go ahead and get us started with uh, some of the particular questions. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Stefano, for your very interesting presentation. And yes, we have several questions, and maybe I can begin with the one from uh, the director of STATEC, uh, Dr. Serge Allegretta. Um, isn't it that the main driver of growth is productivity and population? Productivity depends on well-being, but mainly on technological progress and science. Should we stifle science and technology? I'm sorry, Pauline, I have, uh, uh, I don't hear you very well. Uh, may, um... I don't know your microphone. Uh, I'm uh, sorry for that. I can repeat the question. Yeah, sure. And you can also see it in the chat, but I will repeat it. Okay. <laughs> Isn't it? It is in the chat. Okay. Yeah. With if you click on the chat, you can see all the questions. Okay. And the one from Dr. Serge Legretta is, isn't it that the main driver of growth is productivity and population. Productivity depends on well-being, but mainly on technological progress and science. Should we stifle, stifle science and technology? No, technology is a, is a fundamental part of the solution uh, to uh, ecological problems, of course. The problem is that, is that it is not enough. We need uh, other things. Um, Serge, uh, I'm not sure that increasing productivity leads to economic growth. Greater productivity could be used for increasing output, increasing leisure time. So um, when our productivity uh, increases, we could use uh, such an increase to increase our It's probably something that we need more than greater consumption. Uh, um, in, in, in the sense that uh, we live in affluent societies, but they are affluent from the point of view of consumption, not from the point of view of time. I'm not sure I correctly uh, uh, answered to your question because I did not hear it uh, very well. Um, thank you, Stefano. I suggest we go on with the next questions. Um, I have two related ones, one by EC3 and uh, Paul Thomas. Basically, they ask a very related question. They say, well, um, it is hard to make the case in more materialistic places such as Nigeria or Russia um, that represent basically six sevenths of the world's population those populations still want to grow and to catch up with the developed world, and then the world in total will continue to grow. So I think this question boils down to, does this reasoning apply to uh, developing countries as well, or only to developed ones? And mm. the question by Paul Thomas was very related. He says, uh, developed economies have inducted the idea of growth into developing countries, and now we want to take this back from them. So how would they react to this proposal? Okay, let's let's compare the current uh, phase of uh, the Chinese development uh, with a similar phase of Chinese development uh, of um, uh, with a similar phase of development in Europe. Um, China now is currently experiencing a transition from an agricultural to an industrial economy. Uh, an almost completed transition. This uh, phase in Europe was uh, in the 1950s and 70s. 
the end of the 70s, the, the transition to uh, an industrial economy was already completed. And um, in, uh, in Europe, uh, we, in that period, we, um, we created very important, important common goods, like uh, an educa a public education system, um, a public healthcare system, universal health system. These are common goods. So, uh, it gives a lot of social housing. Uh, we reduced inequality. Now, compare what is happening in China. Um, education is a luxury good. Healthcare, almost. It's costly. Uh, enormous difference in the quality of the healthcare and of the education and accessing to higher quality is costly. And uh, um, inequality skyrocketed in China. So they did something very different from what we did. What is the result? The result is that in Europe, we grew at most uh, at the rate of 8% yearly in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And China has grown uh, at uh, 15 at the rate of 15 percent for many years. Why? Because uh, people react to the scarcity in a, in a country in which money is uh, the only thing that matters. And without money, you have no access to anything. People uh, people pursue money. It's the only thing that can improve their quality of life. So. Uh, my point is again that the, scar the scarcity of common goods, the, the, the totally private system of, the Ch of China and also of India, is pushing economic growth, but in an undesirable direction. In, in, that's the reason why so much growth did not produce greater, greater happiness uh, uh, in China and India. Happiness declined sharply. So what uh, the, my point is this, it is better. Uh, I agree that those poor countries need to grow. But the point is how to grow, to what speed. Uh, the message of this, uh, of my presentation is basically that is not growth that matters for uh, happiness. It is the social quality of growth that if I of growth is to reduce the society to a, to a social desert, then growth is not worth. So, uh, my point is that, that uh, these countries need to grow, but need to grow in another way and slow and more slowly. That's helpful, Stefano. I think uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, which is the next question? Oh, sorry, uh, Pauline will uh, read it out for us. Yeah, so I have two more remarks. Uh, do you hear me more now? Is it okay to hear me? Yeah, try to uh, to talk. Okay, I will try to talk louder. Uh, surely, higher. Uh, we have two remarks so from Mark Henry. Surely, higher GDP in developing nations is correlated with increasing environmental awareness and actions in measures. So, increased GDP and private wealth needs to greater environmental improvements in the main. And the second remarks was, there I say, the US is not the best model of modern developed uh, nations. There are better examples in the European Union, which are experiencing improving health and work on social trends, not disimproving. It was just two remarks. And then there are two more questions, so maybe I'll let Francesco, or if you want to react on this remark. I, I'm sorry, Pauline, I, I don't hear you. But maybe Francesco uh, can read uh, these uh, remarks because uh, I don't hear your microphone. I'm really sorry for that. Okay. Francesco, uh, okay. read that. Let, let me step in. Um, the first, uh, there are two comments by Mark Henry. He says that uh, uh, higher GDP in developed nations is correlated 
with increasing environmental awareness and action in nations. So increased GDP and private wealth leads to greater environmental improvement. That's uh, his expectation. And, and the second comment is uh, uh, the US is not the best model of modern developed nations. There are better examples in the European Union which are experiencing improving health and work and social trends. Mm. Well, the, the second remark, uh, I have no comment because I agree with that. And um, about the first remark, it is not economic growth that brings uh, greater awareness of ecological problems. Growth brings greater ecological problems. That's why people react, because in China, uh, China has very ambitious uh, green projects now, but they are the consequence of the fact that uh, that's probably the most polluted country all over the world. And uh, Beijing is the most polluted uh, city on the world. So it is not uh, uh, greater GDP that brings uh, more ecological awareness. It is the damages of GDP that, may, that uh, bring uh, the need to tackle ecological problems. Thank you, Stefano. I would, uh, do we still have time for uh, no. one question? No. I think uh, it's, it, it has to be really quick. And well, uh, there is the uh, last question, uh, let's say by, um, uh, Thomas Schaubrück, who says, concerning possession versus sharing, does possession not lead to security, independence, and convenience, and in those ways it leads to happiness? Has this been taken into account in your comparison of sharing versus possessions? Do the benefits of sharing outweigh that of possession in every case? In every case. Greater possession doesn't lead to greater security. Um, uh, just an example. In the poor countries, they share, uh, um, they have forms of uh, sharing capital. Um, they um, put together their uh, savings and uh, lend money to the people participating to the group alternatively. This is a form of social insurance that we lost in uh, de developed countries. Now we have, uh, of course, we have substitutes, we have banks, but uh, the security, I mean, we are social animals. We all need uh, to belong to something. Uh, we all need uh, to feel to be loved. And uh, that's a very important uh, component uh, of our feeling of security of course i'm i'm not stating that money is not important and a decent standard of life is not important these are preconditions which are fundamental for creating happiness but that's not all we need uh, once we have reached a, a reasonable uh, standard of material uh, affluence what makes greater happiness is other stuff. And the problem of the way we have constructed our society in Western countries is that uh, it's very unbalanced uh, the, towards uh, possessing uh, and uh, it overlooks sharing, which is an, another important component of the feeling of security and of happiness. Uh, uh, but uh, many thanks for the question because probably there's a misunderstanding, uh, which is, of course, is my fault, in the sense that I'm not stating that uh, material affluence is not important. It's a, it is important. It's a precondition. But we have reached it in, in industrial countries. And what we need now for progress is something different. Um, thank you, Stefano, for your replies. I'm afraid uh, uh, time is over for... Uh for the Q&A, but there are still uh, uh, at least three questions open in the chat that I invite you to have a look at and perhaps follow up uh, 
by providing answers in the chat to uh, to those who asked. Uh, with this, I would go. I would give the floor back to to Kelsey. But thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Professor Easterlin, if you could uh, go ahead and share your screen, and I will introduce you. Uh, thank you very much, Stefano, and all of the participants for their questions. For their question. Are you unmuted? And yes, you are unmuted. You are unmuted. Thank you. Uh, when I introduce uh, when you, I introduce I'm going to mute you again, but just for a again, moment, just for a moment, we hear an echo through your echo speaker. Through your speaker. I know you don't hear it at the moment, but, uh, yeah, so it'll just take a second. Okay, your slides are loaded, though. That's great. Can you hear me okay, Dad, Kelsey? Uh, I can hear you, uh, so I think it should be fine. Okay. All right, so I'll mute you uh, just for a moment while I introduce you, and then I'll unmute you. Uh, right afterwards. Uh, right afterwards. Okay. All right, so uh, many of you uh, know who Richard Eastman is. Um, Richard Eastman is a university professor emeritus of economics at the University of Southern California. Um, and as you know, uh, he is one of the most influential researchers in happiness studies. Uh, he's best known for the Eastman paradox, which is a set of happiness income findings he discovered first in 1974. Uh, what you may not know is that there is also a Easterlin hypothesis. Um, before Easterlin was known for his work in happiness, he was actually known for his work in demography and economic history. Uh, today, he's been cited nearly 50,000 times. Uh, I'm sure the next time you look that up, it will say 50,000. Uh, the author of many books, uh, numerous articles. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a distinguished fellow at the American Economic Association. He is also a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences the Econometric Society, and the Institute for the Study of Labor, uh, and a former president of the Population Association of America, Economic History Association, and Western Economic Association International. Uh, so there are quite a few uh, organizations here that are very prestigious in the United States. Uh, and earlier this year, he published his most recent book, An Economist Lessons on Happiness, Farewell Dismal Science. Uh, I encourage you to take a look, but you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, during the presentation. So without further ado, uh, Professor Eastland, the floor is yours and I'm unmuting you right now. So what you'll need to do is, uh, there you go, perfect. There you go. Great. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Yes. And I appreciate uh, those of you uh, who are uh, attending at uh, probably uh, rather late hour in Europe. Uh, it's an early hour here and we're on the road to a hundred degree day in Southern California. I'd like to talk about one of the lessons on happiness that uh, is discussed in uh, my new book. Uh, it's uh, explaining happiness and income the relation between the two in the short and long run. Uh, uh, oh, is that changing? Hold on, the screen is at the uh, PowerPoint isn't changing for me. Kelsey? Uh, I, I think what happened is when I sent the unmute request, it went back to the meeting. Uh, so try clicking back on the PowerPoint. Oh, I see the cursor. Try clicking. Oh, there we go. Great. Right, there we go. Great. Yeah, we got it. So uh, let me uh, start off uh, by uh, discussing uh, the short and long run uh, relationships between happiness and income. Uh, 
Okay. Hold on a minute. How do we get into this? Okay. You can uh, 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 so uh, in the diagram, uh, uh, in the diagram uh, before you, uh, <coughs> The solar line indicates uh, the course of income uh, over time, and the Y uh, line, the H line indicates the course of happiness over time. And as you can see, they go up and down together. So in the short run, uh, happiness and income uh, are <coughs> positively related. And now it's not changing. Uh, I got it. Uh, but if you put a broken a trend line to uh, the two curves, uh, you see that income is trending upward and happiness is constant. So there's a no relationship uh, in the long run, which is shown by the trends. Uh, in the two uh, diagrams. So the question is, uh, how do we explain uh, the positive relationship in the short run and the no relationship in the long run? Mm -hmm. Here's an example of what happens if you fail to distinguish between the short and long run. And this is a quotation from a book by Diane Coyle a brief with the affectionate history of GDP. And she says, the silliness of the notion the rising GDP does not increase happiness at all is even easier to see when you remember that a recession, when the GDP declines just a little, makes people very happy. So what she's trying to disprove is that rising GDP does not increase happiness. That's the long run relationship. And she's trying to disprove it by referring to the short run relationship. A recession makes people very unhappy. As we'll see, the two are determined by quite different circumstances. So let's look first at uh, happiness income in the long run. Uh, and the key to understanding, explaining the long run relationship can be captured in the simple phrase, keeping up with the Joneses. So let's start off with, with some evidence of the nil long run relationship. We go back to figure one, uh, where uh, we have broken trend lines uh, fitted to both income and happiness. And now we say, let's we suppose we have this picture uh, for multiple countries, estimates of the broken line of happiness and income. The question is, if we compare countries with regard to their trends, their broken line trends, do we find that sharper uptrends in income are accompanied by greater increases in happiness? <laughs> And the answer to that is no, there's no significant relationship. Sharper uptrends in income are, are not accompanied by greater growth in happiness. Uh, the latest evidence on that is uh, in an article by myself and Kelsey uh, in uh, the Handbook of Labor, Human Resources, and Population Economics. There we look at data from the World Value Survey and the European Value Survey for 54 countries spanning the period 1981 to 2019. Uh, and then we look at the Gallup World Poll from 2005 to 2019, 
uh, and cover 123 countries. And in both cases, we get no significant relation. Sharper up trends in income are not accompanied by greater growth and happiness. So some people say, oh, well, that only applies to developed countries. Uh, the evidence in the previous slide, in fact, includes less developed countries. But let's look specifically at the happiness trend in three low-income countries, China, Japan, and India, in periods in which GDP per capita has multiplied by about three to four fold. So here's China's trend in life satisfaction in the period 1990 to 2012. As you can see, it's slightly U-shaped. Here's Japan in the period 1958 to 1987. Uh, and again, the trend is flat. And finally, India since 2006, the trend, if anything, is negative. So here we have three countries in periods in which growth was phenomenal. If we would certainly expect uh, an impact on positive impact on happiness, and in fact, we do not. We get the nil relationship that we get for broader sets of countries. So now the question is, how do we explain the nil long run relationship? Uh, and the key to that uh, is in an article by Amos Fairsky and Daniel Kahneman in the QJE in 1991, which says, well, people evaluate any given situation based upon an internal benchmark. For example, as a man five foot nine inches tall, the answer is in America, no, in India, yes. Because for people in each country, the internal benchmark is the height of others in the country. So in India, the average height of men is five feet six inches. A man five feet nine inches is viewed as tall. In the United States, the average height of men is five feet ten inches. A man five foot nine inches is not viewed as tall. The internal benchmark is the height of others in the country. So now, turning back to income, let's do a thought experiment. And in what follows, income is always real income in 2021 dollars. And imagine you are just about to graduate and take your first job. Which would you prefer, A or B? A is earning 100000 on graduation, B earning 50000 on graduation. I think I know what everybody would say as the answer to that. But now suppose the question was formulated as follows, which would you prefer, A or B? If the choice were A, earning 100000 on graduation when others earn 200000 or earning 50000 on graduation when other graduates earn 25000 And what you will find uh, in general uh, in answering this, people who chose 100000 over 50000 on the first question switch and take 50000 over 100000 on the second question because they're they're ahead of everybody else, whereas in A, they're behind everybody else. So the lesson is the benchmark used to evaluate a person's income is typically the income of others, just as the benchmark used to evaluate an individual's height is the height of others. So happiness tends to vary directly with your own income, but inversely with others' income. 
then the conclusion, how do we explain the nil long rent relationship? When income trends upward, your happiness tends to increase because your own income is greater. But incomes in general are also rising, so others' incomes are greater, and this tends to reduce your happiness. The outcome is that when income trends upward, the net change in happiness is zero. Let's go to happiness and income in the short run now. And the key to explaining the short run relationship can be captured in the phrase, keeping up with the car payments, not with the Joneses. So let's go back to figure one, where we show uh, the short run and the long run relationship between happiness and income. And in the short run, happiness and income are going up and down together. They're positively related. Can others' income, the benchmark that was used to explain the long run relationship, explain the short run relationship? And the answer is no. In a recession, when your own income declines, so too do the incomes in general. The decline in happiness due to the decrease in your own income is offset by the decrease in others' income. So if others' incomes were the relevant benchmark in the short run, then happiness would not decline in a recession. But it does. Why? The answer is that the uh, relationship of happiness uh, to income is asymmetric. The response of happiness to a decrease in income is different from an increase in income. For evidence, uh, there's a recent excellent article in the Review of Economics and Statistics in 2018. Uh, and uh, Deneb et al. say, we find, this is based on an analysis of three different bodies of data, that measures of subjective well-being are more than twice as sensitive to negative as compared to positive economic growth. This is reminiscent of the early uh, analysis by uh, an another analysis by Kahneman and Dvorsky uh, called Prospect Theory, in which they essentially said the same thing. People are twice as sensitive to negative changes as to positive changes in income. So the question is, why do you get this asymmetric response uh, <clears throat> if income is going down rather than up? And the answer is the benchmark that people use in evaluating uh, their own income situation shifts from others' incomes uh, to one's own past peak income, one's personal best, a fixed amount. <clears throat> so as income increasingly falls below its previous peak, happiness progressively declines. And as income recovers toward the previous peak, happiness improves. Why does the benchmark change is the key question. And the answer is it's forced on individuals by the growing burden of meeting periodic financial debt payments. As income continues to decline, the problem emerges and progressively worsens of meeting financial obligations incurred when your income was higher. Payments on mortgages or rental agreements, payments on the purchase for payments on purchase or lease agreements for automobiles and other big ticket items, amounts due on credit card debt, student loans, utility bills, insurance, taxes, and the like. 
multiple studies have found a negative impact on happiness of debt, debt payments, and financial difficulties. So Hansen has a study up in Norway, Anka Pagnol on the United States. Uh, another study is for Iceland, one on Australia, and one on China. What happens to keeping up with the Joneses in the short run? The answer is it's replaced by keeping up with the car payment. Individuals are forced to focus on their own increasingly difficult financial situation. The fact that the Joneses are having the same problem doesn't help you meet the payments required on your own financial obligations. How pervasive is the burden of debt problem? Well, for example, in the United States, 80% uh, of Americans were in debt, and the median amount owed was about $68,000. In Europe, uh, the typical relationship is the, uh, the debt uh, to GDP relationship is a one to one. So the outcome for happiness and income in the short run is that in a recession, happiness goes down enough as income declines below its previous peak and then recovers. And this is due largely to the increasing and then decreasing pressure to meet financial obligations, the varying difficulty of keeping up with the car payment. So the conclusion explaining happiness and income in the short and the long run is in the short run, happiness varies directly with income. In the long run, there is a nil relationship. Why? It's because of the asymmetry in the benchmark people use in evaluating income change in the short run and the long run. When income falls below its previous peak and then recovers, the benchmark is keeping up with the car payment, the short run relation. When income trends upward beyond its previous peak, it's keeping up with the Joneses, the long run relationship. What are the policy applications of these relationships? First, if the goal is to raise happiness, economic growth will not build it. Over the long run, economic growth has a nil effect on happiness. Notice that in formulating policies to promote economic growth, the focus is on the needs of businesses. What can be done to enhance business output and productivity? People and households enter only as agents that can be managed and or manipulated to meet the needs of increasing business output and productivity. Here's an example of the plaintive cry of an Amazon employee, which appeared on the front page of the New York Times just yesterday. We are human beings. We are not tools used to make their daily or weekly goals and rates. So for policies that will raise happiness, the focus should be on people and directed towards meeting people's foremost needs, those most important for their happiness. What types of policies? One, policies that improve, that provide economic security, assurance of jobs, and adequate income. Secondly, policies that meet family needs over the life cycle, childcare, schooling, adequate housing, parental leave, old age security, elderly care. And three, Policies that ensure lifelong physical and mental health care for oneself and one's family. In short, 
instead of focusing on businesses and increasing GDP, focus on people and increasing happiness. And thanks to all of you and to Kelsey for his help here. Thank you, Dick, very much for the presentation. I will get us started real quickly with questions. I think we uh, ended quickly, so some people haven't prepared questions yet. We've spoken about economic security uh, numerous times, and that was one of your conclusions. I hope people can hear me. I know there's an echo. So. So we'll, we'll we'll go ahead and start, we'll, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and start, and we'll go from there as people respond. So economic security and so debt. Economic security and debt. Do you think economic security think economic would be less security important? Less important. If people had less if debt. People had less debt. So I'm thinking that so I'm thinking we haven't that yet we haven't tried, yet to tried to look at both of these. Look at both of these. You know variables together. Variables together. Uh, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, I can respect Can you hear me one. okay, Kelsey? Yeah, yes, can you hear me all right? Yeah. So okay. uh, I think uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, that has a, a, a negative impact on people's economic security. Uh, uh, as, as an example, uh, if you uh, uh, look at uh, figures uh, on people's satisfaction with their finances over the life cycle, you'll see uh, their satisfaction with their finances is uh, pretty stable up to a retirement age, or if anything, uh, their satisfaction is actually declining. Somewhat, but in older ages, uh, satisfaction with finances increases quite dramatically, and it's because what's happening is people have been paying off their mortgages, they reduced substantially the burden of debt, and so their economic security is much enhanced by the reduction in their debt. Uh, that's helpful. Thanks. So, so it seems like it also partially explains the U-shaped relationship between happiness and age. Uh, also, you are still sharing your screen. If you want, you can uh, it stop. And I think there's going to be a button across the top. But that's up to you. Okay, and we have a, a question uh, from a question Paul, from, that Pauline will read out. Pauline will read out. Yes, uh, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we have a question from Charles-Henri Di Maria, a researcher uh, of study. Uh, can we believe uh, can the we existence of a virtuous circle? In which happiness will motivate people to become more economically productive, and how governments can foster this process. Uh, I'm having the same problem that Stefano had. I, Kelsey, I wonder, can you repeat the question for me? Uh, yes, uh, one moment. I need to find it. Okay, here it is. Can we believe in the existence of a virtuous circle in which happiness will motivate people to become more economically productive? And how government and how can government foster this process? Uh, so the question is about uh, the effects of happiness uh, on uh, their economic uh, situation. Uh, and their motivation, am I right on that? It's not, uh, it's on uh, whether or not happiness contributes to growth in a positive uh, way. Are you happier people, uh, are, are they more productive? And then at the aggregate level, does that contribute to growth? Yeah, 
That, that seems to be the, uh, the findings of, of a study by Andrew Oswald and uh, some of his collaborators uh, that uh, more people that are more that are happier are more productive. Uh, so the answer is yes, uh, growth would be uh, promoted by greater happiness. Other things equal. All right, uh, that's helpful. Uh, oh, you, Francesco, okay. We have uh, another question. It's a follow up from the last one by Loomer. And it's related to the Kahneman and Deaton paper. Uh, I think it's 2011. High income improves valuation of life, but not an emotional well being. Regarding a positive. Uh, Z. Okay, so the question starts a little bit to translate. It's really about the threshold uh, between income and subjective well being, both life satisfaction and the emotional. Do you remember the study? Yeah, uh, it's a cross cool section study. I, I think we know enough now. Uh, to realize the cross section studies are not telling us anything about what's happening uh, to the effects of uh, income change on people's happiness over time or over the course of a life cycle. Uh, I think uh, that study is also uh, misleading in that uh, its focus is on uh, the uh, uh, the you know, uh, the uh, experiential uh, elements of happiness. So the questions that are being asked uh, are like, uh, over the last uh, 24 hours, uh, how happy have you been? Whereas happiness, as I'm talking about it, has to do with the evaluator uh, conception of happiness. Uh, which is uh, people sitting back and evaluating their overall life circumstances, how they judge them. Uh, thank you for your answer, um, Professor Liston. Uh, we have basically three questions that uh, all rotate along the same issue of inequality uh, by EC3, Mylinda, and Stephen Gordon. Uh, basically, they say there seems to be another policy implication. Keeping up with the Joneses implies that social inequality is something that decreases happiness such as uh, what we have seen going on in the United States or in India. Therefore, uh, uh, um, uh, Stephen adds, uh, the economic growth uh, in China or India has been accompanied by increasing inequality and this leads to the increase in relative deprivation, therefore decrease happiness. So can we say that so the economic growth that based on policies on reducing inequality may increase happiness? And this goes along with the last comment by Mylinda, who, who asks whether your work suggests that the universal income grant will improve happiness by promoting inequality and providing security. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, uh, let me say first, I, I, I'm not at all clear that there's evidence that economic growth uh, reduces inequality. But more to the point, uh, the policies that I talk about promoting uh, economic uh, 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 job security and income security, uh, 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 support for uh, policies that help with uh, child care throughout uh, and other family circumstances throughout the life cycle, policies that uh, improve people's health. Uh, all these policies 
which can be implemented independently of economic growth, are policies that particularly benefit uh, the less advantaged strata of the population. So that you find, for example, in the Nordic countries where these policies are most implemented, the gap in satisfaction with life, with happiness, uh, is substantially less uh, between uh, uh, the uh, um, more advantaged and the less advantaged in the population is gauged by measures like education and income. I hope that answers your question. Okay, there is another question from Mark Henry. Mark Henry. So he's asking about he's asking personal about income. Personal he cites a paper cites stating paper. that there is a lot of research, a lot of research that shows increasing shows personal, increasing income, personal income, income leads to increased leads levels, to of increase personal levels of personal happiness. Happiness. Contrary to your assertion, to your assertion how do you account for this discrepancy? Uh, I think the, the discrepancy reflects the reliance that's common, unfortunately, in economic, economics on cross-section studies rather than time series studies. The kinds of papers he's referring to are cross-section studies, and I quite agree that in the cross-section, uh, happiness and income are positively related. But in time series, the evidence does not support that proposition. Uh, Professor, if I may push a little on behalf of Mark Henry, uh, can you give us some examples related to lottery winners? Uh, so, uh, if a, a person uh, wins, has substantial gains uh, in uh, a lottery winnings, the evidence is uh, that tends to raise their happiness. Uh, that's a situation uh, comparable to my initial example, where your income goes up and income of others does not. If everybody wins the lottery, not that that could really happen, but if everybody wins the happiness, uh, wins the lottery, then happiness, your happiness will not improve. So it's an example, the lottery is an, an example of my income increasing and others not. Whereas uh, the common time series situation is people's incomes tend to rise in, uh, in, uh, concurrently. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Uh, we have a, another question from Maurizio Cugno. He says, Professor Yusen, since the long-run happiness trend of the United States, India, and uh, Italy, which is uh, recent evidence of Francesco Saracino, is declining, uh, is your explanation for the short run valid also for the long run? Uh, I, I think uh, the answer uh, is uh, we have to look at the circumstances uh, of people with regard to their economic security, their family circumstances, and, and their health. Uh, and uh, the, the trends, uh, if they're negative, are basically reflecting the deterioration in those circumstances and the way to reverse the situation is not by promoting economic growth policies, but by promoting policies that deal directly with people's income and employment situation, with their family circumstances, and with their health. Yes, I think that makes sense. I'm not seeing any other questions since Francesca, did I miss something? Uh, and then, okay, so what we can do now is we can open up the floor. I have questions for you, Richard, but 
uh, I can ask you at any time. So, if anybody has questions for Steph or Richard, uh, feel free to uh, put them in the chat now. And uh, we can wait a moment for that. I, I know that we had to cut Stefano short uh, a bit earlier. Maybe to start, uh, Richard, I was curious what you think of Stefano's presentation. So a uh, like a green growth. So not degrowth, but green growth and how that might lead us to promote well-being uh, and reduce our impact on the environment. Oh, you're muted. Um, yeah, I can. Wait, one moment. See, there should be a button for you. Yeah. Oh, here you go. Now you're back. Okay, I think Stefano and I are in agreement about the importance of happiness. Uh, I, I think uh, where we may depart is the extent to which uh, we're looking at uh, fairly sweeping policies uh, uh, versus policies that focus much more on people and on individuals. Uh, so, uh, uh, by and large, uh, I tend to sympathize with what he's saying, but I think the policies that need to be in the forefront are policies uh, that are much more focused on individuals. So let 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 me give uh, an example. Uh, he is arguing that relationships are very important. I agree that relationships are very important. But you need to distinguish between family relationships and relationships beyond the family with relatives, with friends, and so on. And if you look at what's really important for people's happiness, it's the relationships within the family. So I would focus my attention uh, in regard to relationships much more on people, on families than on relationships of a broader nature. So, for example, I think the business about joining clubs or things like that, which are often taken as promoting happiness, is uh, highly questionable. Indeed, I think uh, people might uh, begrudge the time that they have to give up to join clubs and participate. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts. It's, uh, I guess we should give Stefano a chance to respond if he would like to. Stefano? I, I'm sorry, but I have connection problems I'm, uh, and I was losing one of the Part of it was that the relationships within the family are the most important perhaps more important than or more important than the societal wide uh, relationships you're discussing and that the policy should focus most on individuals uh, rather than some of the society wide uh, policies you had proposed Dick, i hope i got you correctly yeah i agree with uh, with dick that uh, um, affective relationships are uh, have a great importance but also the community is important uh, imagine the situation the current situation of families uh, which are uh, which may have uh, very affective uh, relationships uh, within the family but they are they are isolated from the social fabric and imagine what this means in their daily lives um, for instance uh, now kids grow up uh, within homes and in they lost entirely their aut autonomy and uh, uh, parents so became entirely responsible for their time and for their well-being because they have they have totally have lost their autonomy they have few friends they, they meet few people physically of course they do a lot of things online 
So, uh, the, the, in this way, the relationship between parents and kids became obsessive. And uh, um, parents know that they have an enormous responsibility, much bigger than the, before for the well-being of their kids. Uh, when, um, when kids uh, could open the door and go out with, your, with their friends, even if, there were, if their parents were arguing, there were disagreements, fights within the family, they could close the door behind and go with their friends. Now, if they, they, their parents have a bad relationship, this deeply affects their, their well-being. They have no alternative because they, are, they, they live within their homes always. So this situation of social isolation of families, as a matter of fact, created a lot of uh, within family tensions that uh, could be relaxed by a more vibrant social fabric around the families. Uh, and, um, and even the isolation of the, of, the, of the parents is a problem because before any problem they had, they could discuss it with their friends and within the community. But now uh, they are pressed by their time squeezed because they work a lot and they, have, they are alone. They have no, co no community. They have a very poor social life outside the family. And all this situation, it is, it is very hard for families. Uh, and it's worsening the quality of family life. Uh, I cannot imagine the, uh, a working family isolated uh, from the community and uh, from the social fabric. It cannot work. Well, I see a comment uh, uh, from uh, the chat by uh, Sibaba who seems to agree with Stefano's uh, reply. He says, as couple and family therapist, our field shows that family has different meanings based on culture. So it is a measure of relationships, both as bond and a social network. Uh, well, we both, apparently we both need, uh, we, we need both kind of connections. And I uh, leverage on the last comment by Mark Henry, who informs Richard that he just ordered the last book by uh, Professor Easterlin. I am glad to have a copy of his book here, so for you to see it, just fresh yes. on the press, got it from US as a present. And as I'm uh, doing some advertising, uh, also the speech by Stefano Bartolini was, uh, is the subject of a lengthy book that is about to be published, unfortunately, in Italian. Stefano has still this uh, habit to write first in Italian and then into English. Uh, but for those who prefer uh, uh, English, there is actually a short version of the book that is summarized in a brief article that you can download for free at the uh, link that I'm sharing in the chat. So you will find most of the, all of the topics that he touched upon during his speech summarized in that article. Of course, not all the evidence he can discuss in the, um, in the book more at length. Uh, that's for the ad so far. Uh, Francesco. Mm -hmm. Francesco, don't forget to, to say that you, you co-authored that article. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to avoid the conflict of interest, given the position. But okay, full disclosure, I am a co-author of that article. Uh, uh, I also profit of the position uh, to ask a question uh, um, to uh, Stefano concerning the possible engines for change. And here I'm thinking about the uh, dichotomy between intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. We know that people, the reasons why people do, do things matter and that uh, there are some motivations that tend to prevail. And the motivation crowd each other out. If I do something uh, for money, I don't really do it for, let's say the extrinsic motivation tends to uh, crowd out the intrinsic one. So, in this light, uh, social enterprises that are um, uh, organizations built to deprioritize the pursuit of money to fulfill a social mission, 
can they be, or do they have the potential to be an engine of change? What do you think in the, about this? Uh, well, um, what you are describing is a growing part uh, of something uh, which is growing much bigger with an economy which is uh, which is not based uh, on uh, the tit for tat the typical capitalist motivation i do not do anything for nothing uh, but this the, uh, what you're describing is important and is growing but it's a part of something much bigger imagine on the impact uh, of the internet uh, on uh, in making clear that people have very also very different motivation from personal convenience to act. Wikipedia is the biggest encyclopedia uh, of human history, and it is all made with uh, gifts, uh, voluntary contribution. Uh, every time uh, you you write you write on the internet uh, your opinion on a bar, on a restaurant, on a hotel, you are making a gift uh, to someone that you will never know. You will never meet and can never give you anything in exchange for your favor. So it's an entire economy of uh, based on uh, different motivation from extrinsic ones, which is growing. Uh, and, and the Internet uh, had a very big role in highlighting uh, that uh, we are not only economic men and women. Yes, so uh, it's great to hear that we are motivated by so much more. And that includes, you know, your time. Uh, you guys volunteered your time to be with us uh, early in the morning as it is in on the west coast of the US or late in the evening here in uh, Europe. So uh, I think with that, uh, we can uh, wrap up. If there's one last question, uh, send it now. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I would like to remind everyone that we have uh, four more talks coming. Uh, they are posted on the website. Uh, we have Andrew Oswald, Carol Graham, Ruth Hoven, and John DeGrath. Uh, interesting contributors to the quality of life uh, community. And uh, another thing, this recording will be put up online. Uh, we'll send out uh, an email or you can check back onto uh, the website with that information. Uh, and I would like to thank very much uh, Stefano Bart Professor Stefano Bartolini and Richard Eastland for their talks today. Uh, and uh, all of you attendees for your uh, vibrant discussion and for uh, showing up today. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I can't unmute you. Honor. To speak with uh, uh, Lisa Lisa in great honor. I'm really honored. Many really thanks. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.